Turn in your Bibles back to Matthew chapter 16. Stopping, standing still, I trust you'll see for very good reason on one single verse. Matthew 16, verse 18. I said to Michelle this week, pray extra for me. I've spent almost 30 years of my life talking about this verse, and now I get to preach it. <laughs> there is a weightiness and a deep joy and profound privilege in this moment. I've entitled this message, The Church Invincible. Matthew 16, 18, The Church Invincible. Welcome to one of the most controversial and hotly debated texts in all the Bible, but also known as the most hopeful and the most encouraging promise about the church in all of Scripture. My all-time favorite hymn about the church, one we love to sing here at Antioch, is The Church's One Foundation. I wonder if you know that it was written in 1866 by Samuel J. Stone, an Anglican pastor in England, in response to a theological battle raging in another part of the world. Do you happen to know where that theological battle was raging that inspired the great hymn, The Church is One Foundation, in the Natal province, now known as KZN, in a town named Colenso. Who's been to Colenso in Natal? It's still there, right? Well, here's the backstory behind that town and this hymn. The bishop of Natal was Colenso. He was known to be a staunch advocate for the Zulu nation and people, thankfully. However, Bishop Colenso was also a leader in liberal theology, undermining biblical inerrancy. And in 1963, three years before this hymn was written, Bishop Colenso had written a book questioning Moses' authorship of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, and its historical accuracy, treating much of the Old Testament as mythology. It was that same poison of German higher criticism that has since decimated churches across South Africa and in the world in the past century. Remember that next time we sing some of those stanzas, though with a scornful wonder men see her sore oppressed, by schisms rent asunder, by heresies distressed, yet saints their watch are keeping, their cry goes up how long, and soon the night of weeping will be the morn of song. It was during that fierce 19th century South African doctrinal controversy that several other bishops and ministers arose to confront Colenso, to defend Christian orthodoxy, to argue on behalf of biblical authority. And by 1870, and just a few short years later, evangelical Anglicans had been excluded, cut off from mainline Anglicanism. And this is more than a century before the heretical, you know, Bishop Tutu and others further poisoned the mainline Anglican church. Already in 1870, a separate body, now one of the oldest evangelical denominations in the land, of which some of our own members are the fruit, was formed called CISA, Church of England, South Africa, now known as REACH. Listen to an additional verse in Stone's famous hymn that is no longer included in most hymnals. The church shall never perish, her dear Lord to defend, to guide, sustain, and cherish is with her to the end, though there be those who hate her and false sons in her pale. Against the foe or traitor, she ever shall prevail. I will build my church, as we're about to read. If you've been a Christian very long, friends, if you've been involved in the church at all, you know it can get messy, it can be hurtful, it can get heated. What starts off as a wonderfully positive church experience can too quickly turn into something discouraging, disappointing, exhausting, or even infuriating. Unmet expectations, bad doctrine, weak leadership, worldly influences, financial disagreements, Broken relationships, clashing opinions, competing preferences, irritating people, always others, of course, never oneself. <laughs> uh, hundreds of other factors can turn church life into something sour and burdensome. Beloved, let me say, I think the far worse pandemic of our day is churchless Christianity, fueled as well by extreme individualism and so-called digital spirituality and a, a kind of a internet uh, quasi-Christianity 
that is so rife and so rampant. It seems almost every week I bump into or I hear about someone who has uh, given up on the church, so to say, or, or they've withdrawn from the fringes of church life to become a mere spectator or, or bystander, sidelined, bitter, cynical, disillusioned. Even though once they were engaged, they were serving, they were enjoying rich fellowship in the body of Christ, but tragically no longer. How about you? As you sit here this morning, if on a scale of one to 10, you had to rank your enthusiasm about the church, what score would you give yourself? Probably answer privately. Your optimism, your, your confidence, your uh, joy and hope about the Christian church, if a score of one is the lowest and 10 is the highest, what would your score be? And most importantly, what is Jesus' score? What's the cause of his absolute certainty as we're about to read? His unshakable confidence about the church. Why is it that his answer would always and evermore be an 11 on a scale of 1 to 10? And it's his church after all. We're about to find out. Let's read the whole passage again to get the context. Please stand in honor of Christ's word. Listen as I read. Matthew 16 from verse 13. As we looked at last time. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. Oh, Heavenly Father, gracious Lord, please hear our prayer. Mere preaching and teaching, the, our, our best efforts at human explanation, flesh and blood cannot do this. Lord, you alone, by your spirit, through your word, can give the blessedness of blind eyes being opened to discover who Jesus is and, as a result, how he will build his church Raise our confidence, deepen our certainty, strengthen our enthusiasm about your church in these short days of our earthly pilgrimage and sojourn. May we learn to love and view and treasure your church more as you do, based on a biblical understanding and doctrine of the church in the name of her head and Lord, and founder and owner, King Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. Beloved, you, you, you have to wonder, how is it that our Captain Jesus has kept the good ship of Christ's church afloat worldwide? After all these years, through so many stormy waters and endless conflicts and narrow escapes, she hasn't capsized. Is there any text that better explains the church's survival and success than this one? Those five words, I will build my church. This text that we've just read, verse 13 through 20, contains an entire biblical Christology and ecclesiology, a doctrine of Christ and his church, all in a little nutshell here as a, like a thumbnail sketch. And notice, it's all grounded and based in the person and the work of Christ. Last week, his person we saw, verses 13 to 17, his identity, who Christ is. And now, verse 18, and Lord willing, next week, verse 19, we go from his identity to his activity, from his person now to his work, his promise, his guaranteed program and plan and purpose until he returns. Here's what Jesus is up to in this world. 
Notice the language of certainty that frames and fills this section. I will build. Verse 19, I will give you the keys. The opposition will not prevail or overpower. Verse 19, will have been bound or will have been loosed. All revolves around Jesus' earth-shattering announcement here. I will build my church. First time the word church appears in the New Testament. A monumental moment indeed. But not a foreign term to Jewish ears. If you were reading your Septuagint or had access to the Greek Old Testament, ecclesia would show up all over the place because it comes from a Hebrew word, kahal, that the the disciples would have been familiar with. It's used dozens of times in the Old Testament for a congregation, a gathering, an assembly, usually for the purpose of worship. The Jews expected when Messiah returns, he would gather around himself a community of worshipers. And Jesus doesn't say much here. He doesn't tell us what this church would look like or how it would function or be governed or, or uh, what the, 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 the operations would look like. You have to go to the book of Acts for that story, and you have to go to the epistles of the New Testament for those instructions, right? But already right here, the bride of Christ is introduced. She's announced. She has her debut. This is monumentally significant. And again, remember the context, as we saw last time. Verse 17, God revealed to Peter the truth about his son, Jesus. Verse 16, Peter declared him to be Christ, the Son of the living God. Then you ought to be asking, why did the Father send his Son into the world? What what will happen when others follow the example of Peter and the apostles, joining in this confession of faith? What's that going to lead to? And who should we let into this community or put out? What happens when people die? Uh, through persecution especially or martyrdom and what happens when Christ is about to die the head and the founder of this new organization or body that's the burden behind verses 18 and 19 and what Jesus develops even further in Matthew 18 in the context of restoration and discipline and finally in chapter 28 with the church's mandate and, and great commission and marching orders haven't you wondered at times Right now, in heaven, what is Jesus up to? And by his Holy Spirit, though he's invisible on earth, what's he busy with? It's a fascinating study. And in the New Testament, you'll get a a, a list. I love teaching this in Christology class, in theology, to our seminary students. You'll find Jesus is reigning. He's interceding for his church, right? He is indwelling us by his spirit. He is seeking and saving the lost. He is gathering in his elect. He is shepherding his flock. He is the vine, uh, making us fruitful as his branches, and on and on. The list of the present, theologians call it the session, the sitting at the right hand of the Father. What Jesus is doing right now as we speak, as we are seated here. But surely the tip of that spear, the heart, and the central strategy of it all is these five words. I will build my church. Think about it. It, it, Peter has rightly identified who Jesus is in verse 16. And Jesus immediately explains whose are his. Who belongs to him. Who he would redeem by his blood. As scriptures go, go on to say, the, the, the church of God purchased with his own blood. It's as if Jesus at this point is saying, Peter, we can't talk about me without talking about mine. Like a mama with her chicks, another image that our Lord would use. Hear this, child of God, this morning. Whatever church hurt you have or will experience. No matter how disturbed we are about the pathetic state of the church and the desperate need for revival in the church, we dare not forget, we must remember, no builder, no architect, no engineer, no project manager ever took more ownership than Christ does of his church. How does the whole Gospel of Matthew 
28 chapters. The whole book concludes in the last chapter, in the last verse, by promising us, Jesus says, I'll be with you always to the end of the age. Last time I checked, it hasn't come yet, though it sure seems to be close. I'll be with you. And this is what I'm doing. It's as if Jesus responds to Peter by saying, a groom can't forget his bride. A master and a lord doesn't ignore his servants. The chief shepherd doesn't forget his flock. The head cannot ignore his body. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He said to Saul on the Damascus Road when he's hunting for and hating Christians. I say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock I will build that's very personal involvement. I will build my church. That's very personal ownership. Notice, not your church. Not our church. Not his church. Her church. Not Tim's church or this elder or that pastor or this founder member or this big giver. Not, not this evangelist or church planter. Whoever God might have used or some bishop or, or doctor. Or surely not any of the so-called prophets today and apostles and miracle workers that claim the church as their own, some celebrity or theologian or big name. Notice, beloved, Christ's guarantee here is not to build any one local church or a specific congregation. He promises to build his universal church worldwide, found in local assemblies, but never equated with any one denomination or only one local church. I will build my church. Remember how John's apocalypse, the book of Revelation, the first three chapters begin? The risen Lord, this warrior priest and king, holding in his hands the angels of the seven churches. With the key of David, with the keys of death and Hades. Keys equals ownership, right? Walking among his golden lampstands, right? The candlesticks, the churches. Speaking, purifying, protecting, commanding, controlling, leading. You say, Tim, help me apply this today. So what? I'll tell you. It means Christ, our maker and builder, our owner and head, should remain central and foremost, large and in charge in every local church. Isn't it concerning? If you only hear people talking about, well, here's how we do church, or here's how they do church, or this is how so-and-so uh, 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 -so does church. Should we not start by asking how Jesus does church according to his word? Are we following his New Testament blueprint? Some of you know building. You've been a part of projects or renovations, just as we are busy with at our house currently, preparing for my in-laws in the new year, Lord willing. The building of Christ. Are, are, are we sticking to his exact specifications in the New Testament? Are we building with his prescribed building materials? Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Are we using gold and silver and precious stones of gospel, Christ-centered ministry? Or are we wasting time with wood, hay, and stubble of fleshly wisdom and, and human pragmatism? Are we employing the right laborers according to the biblical description for the members of the body. Have we appointed appropriate supervisors of the project? In other words, qualified elders, blameless overseers, faithful deacons. And what about the initial standards of quality control? Are they still in place? Ephesians 4, for example, as we saw earlier. And the first cornerstone, is that still firmly in place? Shaping, guiding, governing, directing the whole project? The person, the work of our Lord Jesus Christ? You've been to a construction site. Some of us remember eight years ago, right? <laughs> Hard hats and all, right? As this sanctuary went up, as exciting, as wonderful as that was, it pales in comparison to Jesus building his church. Every time Christians gather, every true church is a spiritual construction site. Everywhere believers gather as a New Testament congregation, you could fly a banner over their heads it says Christ's work in progress heaven's project underway therefore be patient <laughs> don't be discouraged don't despair 
do realize what Scripture tells us right now, as you're listening to a sermon, as I'm seeking to give a sermon, as you interact with the body of Christ after the service this morning, as you welcome visitors tonight, as you meet with your small group, as you phone a brother or sister in Christ this week or pray with another member in the body, the whole building, Ephesians 2 tells us, being fitted together was growing. Is that what the text says? Is growing. Into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also were being built. Is that what it says? No. Are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit, Ephesians 2. Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, as living stones, you were being built up. No. Are, right now. Being built up as a spiritual house. What is more awe-inspiring than to know that the Lord Jesus is busy with the grandest of all projects and the greatest of all endeavors, and we get to be a part of that. One of the great reformed and evangelical heroes of the 20th century was the late James Montgomery Boyce of the historic 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, about to celebrate their 200th anniversary. They have stood firm for almost two centuries as a pillar church for biblical truth and for the clarity of the gospel. But Boyce's own life was tragically cut short dying of cancer at age 59. Some of you remember when he visited here in South Africa. I had the privilege of hearing him once at Grace Community Church. A very distinct, uh, memorable voice. And he was a giant of a pastor, theologian, leader, in the pulpit, on radios, in his books, and, and much more. And soon after Dr. Boyce died in 2001, one of his pastoral staff was asked, what in the world is your church going to do? How will 10th Presbyterian survive? What huge shoes to fill? And this godly, well-taught staff member answered, well, you know, 10th Church has always been a one-man show. And that man is Jesus Christ, the God-man, head of his church, builder and owner. I think we'll be just fine. As the, another hymn writer put it, I love thy church, O God. Her walls before thee stand, dear as the apple of thine eye, engraven on thy hand. For her my tears shall fall, for her my prayers ascend, for her my cares and toils be given, till toils and cares shall end. That was Timothy Dwight, grandson of Jonathan Edwards, one of the first presidents of, of uh, I think it was either Yale or Princeton. Have you seen last week's article from our seminary by one of our graduates and one of our own former members here at Antioch, Martin Sitifani. The title of the article is, Is Grace Bible Church Soweto a Biblical Ecclesia? You can go there, shepherdsafrica.coza, one word, shepherdsafrica.coza. Is Grace Bible Church Soweto a Biblical Ecclesia? Martin gives shocking recent examples from their pulpit of false teaching and twisting of Scripture. And if we don't want to rescue people from false worldly churches with biblical truth, we're cowards. And we're missing out on how Christ builds his church. But the reaction to Martin's article from a few so-called like-minded Fellow pastors trained in good seminaries has been disturbing to me. Defending Grace Bible Church Soweto, even though it's the Joel Osteen of Johannesburg, instead of standing with the truth of the gospel. Shame on you. May they repent as well for defending error. Instead of standing with Martin in a faithful warning in love to rescue people from false churches. Where has our spine gone today? Our builder, number one. Number two, our bedrock. I think I forgot to tell you, this is three reasons to be confident in and committed to the church against all odds. Three reasons. We love the church and we would give our lives to the church. First, we saw our builder, could say verse 18b, I will build my church. Second is our bedrock. And then later we'll see number three, our battle. Our builder, our owner, our founder, Jesus. But now we've learned about our bedrock. 
Look at the text. How does the verse begin? I also say to you that you are Peter. In the original, it reads, I also now. Think about the link with the previous verses. I think there's at least a, a, a couple of connections here. I think Jesus is saying, uh, Petros, Peter, <laughs> my father gave you the revelation, and now I give you this declaration. And, and Peter, you told me who I am? Buckle up. I'm going to tell you who you are. I also now say to you that you are Petros, who first brought Simon to Jesus. Do you remember? John chapter 1, his brother. That's right. Andrew. On that day, prophetically, Jesus renamed Simon Petros, or Cephas in the Aramaic. Rocky, Mr. Stone. In other words, you, you'll be bold and strong, a valiant and a mighty leader for Christ one day. And it's already starting to happen now with Peter's confession. Now in verse 16, by sovereign grace, Jesus is transforming this man. The old is gone, the new is coming. Oh, and doesn't Scripture also say, those who honor me, I will honor? And so Jesus does here. I also now say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, and here's where the fun begins. <laughs> Everyone agrees our Lord is making a pun. It's a play on words. You are Petros, and upon this Petra, but the bait comes and the sparks fly, or should I say the stones fly, <laughs> on the question of what the pun means. Who is the rock? I'll sum it up for you as best I can. There's three major options. Either it is Peter himself, or it is Peter's confession, or it is Jesus the rock. And I want to take them in reverse order from what I see as weakest to the strongest of the options. First of all, is the rock Christ? Now, according to the rest of the Bible, of course, Jesus is the living stone. He is our chief cornerstone. But in this context, and in the language Jesus uses here, it's unlikely that the rock is Christ. And it would seem to nullify the wordplay on Peter's name. And if you say, oh, but he said, don't be a house built on sand, be built on the rock, that's fine. But that was 10 chapters ago and about 12 to 15 months earlier. Not so likely that that's exactly what Jesus has in mind. The focus was on Jesus in the earlier verses and his role, but now notice the camera has shifted to Peter and his role. And, and by the way, Christ is portrayed here as the builder and the owner more than the foundation. Even though, like I said, that's very true from the rest of the Bible. Second option, and by the way, second and third options have some overlap, and we can shake hands and almost find a, a combo in the end. First option, the rock is Christ. I don't think so. Secondly, the rock is Peter's confession. And this is getting closer. Everything does hinge on verse 16, his bold proclamation. You are the Christ. But the pun he uses is a bit stronger than that. It's not just pointing to Peter's words impersonally. Jesus didn't say, upon these words or upon this statement. He points to the personal role Peter would play. And I don't think we should read too much into the Petros, Petra distinction or make the grammar carry too much weight there. Third option is the rock Peter himself. I believe it is. Upon you, Peter, Peter as a believer, Peter the Christian, and the spokesman for the apostles, in your lead role of confessing me as Messiah, in your proclaiming of the gospel on behalf of the 12 and the church that would follow. It is the most natural reading of the text, friends. The nearest antecedent at, before the word this rock is the name Peter. Majority view amongst the interpreters nowadays. In refuting the deadly errors of Roman Catholicism, as I'll do in a moment, we mustn't overreact not taking this text at face value. It's emphatic in the original here. You, you are rocky, and upon this rock I will build my church. Peter, I gave you the nickname in the first place, unearned, undeserved, by my grace alone. Ever heard of another guy named Abram? 
who got his name changed to? Oh, or by the way, uh, Yaakov, who got his name changed to? <laughs> Israel. Peter, I told you I would turn you into something you are not. This is not about what you're going to make of yourself. It's what I'm going to make of you. When you recognize who I am as the Christ, the Son of the living God, flesh and blood can't pull this off. Only my Father can open your eyes. And friends, remember where all this is happening. As some of us have had the privilege of visiting there, or you can look it up. I tried my best last week to describe it. Caesarea Philippi, the cliff face of Mount Hermon, the massive grotto cave of the cult of Pan, the, the bedrock upon which were these pagan Herodian, idolatrous temples in the first century and at the time of Christ visiting and perhaps even standing nearby. It's as if Jesus is saying, Peter, my church will be supreme and even stronger than all these heathen houses of worship across the landscape. My church will dominate in the end, though not as you expect. Built upon a far stronger bedrock, a granite slab of surest footing, the biblical gospel heralded from the feeble lips of unlikely Peter and believers who would follow. Okay, there's a sense in which, I told you, you can't separate the man from his message, the confessor from his confession. One day God will use angels to shout the gospel from the mid-heavens. But now in this church age, he's chosen us, weak human Frail vessels, unlikely instruments, and it all began with Peter. We have this treasure in jars of clay, Scripture says, Second Corinthians chapter 4, baked dirt. How's that for a healthy self-image? <laughs> so that God gets all the glory, so that no one boasts in mere men, but in God alone. Upon this rock, Peter, you, I will build my church, because you have just proclaimed the truth. Bear in mind the Old Testament background and the ancient world which knew the safest place to build your city was upon a high rock. What do we read in the Psalms? Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. He will lift me up on a rock, give my feet a firm place to stand. Jerusalem was located on the holy hill, right? You can see why John Newton wrote another famous hymn about the church that we love to sing. I think the tune is the national anthem of uh, Germany or something. It's glorious things of thee are spoken. Zion, city of our God. He whose word cannot be broken formed thee for his own abode. On the rock of ages founded. What can shake thy sure repose? With salvation's walls surrounded, thou may smile at all thy foes. <laughs> Jesus is saying, Never was there a safer city. Never was there a more impregnable fortress than my church. She will be established. She is anchored upon infallible gospel truth, proclaimed from fallible mouths like Peter and the rest. I will take Peter and the 12 apostles. By my spirit, I'll make them bold and unashamed. At Pentecost, I will build my church through their gospel proclamation. Make no mistake, Jesus says. When my Father's sovereign grace draws in his elect, reveals his Son, Jesus, to them, the Lord says, I will take this community of confessors, starting with Peter, and I will make them stand firm and tall as my pillar in support of the truth, as we saw two weeks ago from 1 Timothy 3 and even tonight. Peter, this frail, perishing mortal, Yet through him I will build my mighty church, immortal, imperishable, invincible, unstoppable. And by the way, doesn't Ephesians chapter 2 say the New Testament church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets? And the first of the list on gifts in, in Ephesians and 1 Corinthians is apostles. And we just saw Ephesians 4 starts with the apostles. In Revelation 21, the New Jerusalem will have 12 foundation stones named after 12 apostles. And of all the 12, who does Jesus single out in John chapter 21? to give another kind of commission to the church. If you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, feed my sheep. Three times, and he's talking to Petros, Peter. Every time the 12 are listed, whose name comes first? Peter. 
What's the theme of the book of Acts, friends? Acts 1, verse 8. You will receive power when my Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses to... Remember, there's three concentric circles. It's the outline for the whole book of Acts. Jerusalem, who preached at Pentecost? Peter. Judea, Samaria, Acts chapter 8 and following. Go read. Peter. And the ends of the earth. First Gentile convert, Cornelius, through the preaching of the man with a foot-shaped mouth. <laughs> Peter, upon this rock. Ah, oh, you say, whoa, 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 Tim. Yeah, I believe in one holy, universal, apostolic church. Oh, by the way, when the church was birthed through Peter's preaching at Pentecost, she devoted herself to the first thing on the list, apostles' doctrine. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. Oh, hang on, Tim. That, are, are we now endorsing the Roman Catholic view that Peter was the first pope what led to the original church split on a uh, massive scale, the, the great schism of 1054 between the East and West? And of course you know the answer is absolutely not. Millions have been deceived by this damning lie from Rome for centuries around the world. Listen to the First Vatican Council, 1870, about anyone who denies, quote, that the blessed Peter should have perpetual successors in the primacy over the whole church, or if you deny that the Roman pontiff is not the successor of blessed Peter in, his, in this primacy, let him be anathema. In other words, all you Protestants who hold to a biblical view that there is no pope and there is no papacy and there is no papal line of uh, succession, you are damned to hell. Let me quickly give you four reasons we know that Peter was no pope. That Jesus was not establishing here in Matthew 16, 18, or verse 19, as we look at next week, Lord willing, not any papal office, any papal line of succession, no vicar of Christ on earth whatsoever. Four reasons. First of all, fallibility. You think Peter's infallible? You better not read the next few verses. <laughs> you know what happens when Jesus says, I'm going to the cross? Peter rebukes him. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Try that on the Pope next time you, you bump into him. Wonderful papal example here. And, and later, Peter will deny Jesus. How many times? Three times, right? When Peter does this, he's failing his duty as a bedrock. He is abdicating his apostolic calling. He's not serving as a foundation stone, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Like anyone else who opposes the message of the cross. After fallibility, second reason we are not Roman Catholics is accountability. Accountability. The early church knew nothing of Peter having some personal headship or inherent uh, or unique authority over the church or primacy. The book of Acts is so clear, friends. Acts chapter 8, the church sends Peter and John. They answered to the church. Acts chapter 11, to give who calls Peter to give an account of what happened in Caesarea, uh, 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 the other Caesarea, with Cornelius and the vision on the rooftop. The church calls Peter to give an account. He answers to the congregation. And, and then uh, Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council resolving theological controversy. Who leads the meeting? James. Oops. He didn't get the memo about the Roman papacy. And then Galatians chapter 2, when Peter is getting all uh, racist again about his Jewish privilege, Paul rebukes him. Oops. Is Peter a lead apostle with a foundational role? Yes. Is he head and founder of the church? 1,000% absolutely not. First Peter 5, Peter says, I'm a fellow elder with the other leaders in the church, who should not lord it over one another, by the way, 1 Peter 5. And he says, Jesus alone is the chief shepherd. Fallibility. What's the second one? What did I call it? Yeah, accountability. The third reason we're not Roman Catholics, priority. Priority. Notice, there's no special authority given here. It's a simple historical priority. God chose the Jews first. Not because they deserved it. He, he picked Moses to be the first leader, not because he deserved it. 
So here, God has opened Peter's eyes to see who Christ is and to play a leading role in the birth of the church as a plain, undeniable, historical fact. Fourth, we are not Roman Catholics because of fallibility, accountability, priority, and chronology. Chronology. Do you know there is no mention in history until around A.D. 50 that Peter was, had any kind of papal authority or role? And it is not in, if you want an ecumenical council that recognizes some sort of uh, 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 papal authority from Peter, you won't find it for the first 500 years of church history. So much for an unbroken succession of pontifical authority from Rome or sacramental anointing or laying on of hands, Spurgeon nails it in, in typical um, vintage Spurgeon-esque talking about this unbiblical man-made tradition. He says, that's the laying on of empty hands on top of empty heads. <laughs> Fallibility, accountability, priority, and chronology. Or more seriously, Matthew Henry says, it calls for a thousand pities when we see how this great word of comfort for the church has been twisted and forced to serve Antichrist. Isn't it terribly ironic that the forces of hell, which will not prevail against the church, have unleashed so much poison and deception at this very text? Number three, we've seen our builder, our bedrock, third, our battle. Jesus knows his departure is imminent. His death is looming. The cross is near. How will his church survive? The church family... Today, no matter how bleak, how much apostasy, how few good churches and faithful preachers seem to be left, and genuine believers who aren't false converts, and, and no matter how rampant the error and widespread the heresy and popular the false doctrines and big the, the pragmatic churches are, don't get the Elijah complex, remember? Remember? Forgot the Lord still had a remnant, 7,000 who had not bowed the knee to Baal. Yes, the darkness is closing in before our very eyes. Did we not just see, I think less than three years ago, the arrogance and the shamelessness of our secular, anti-Christian society declaring the church non-essential, which that recent documentary has thankfully preserved and recorded for us. And, and this is Caesarea Philippi. Remember, Panias, the, the, the backdrop here, once more is important because Jesus says, I will build my church upon this rock and the gates of Hades will not overpower it, verse 18. This is why we call it our battle. And the gates of Hades could have been mentioned because Jesus knew there at that grotto cave at Caesarea Philippi, those bubbling springs I told you last week that feed into the Jordan River, when they come out from the cave, especially in the ancient pagan mythological superstitious mind, it was eerie and it was, you know, dark and mysterious. They called it the River Styx, S-T-Y-X. It was the gateway to the underworld. It was the, the borderland or the, the edge between this world and the next. These were the kind of views they had about the water coming out of that very cave. It was the doorway uh, into Hades. The boundary between this world and the next. And sure enough, what does Jesus say? I will build my church, verse 18, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. In the Old Testament, Gates of Hades was a Hebrew idiom for powers of death. You know the ancient world. The city gates spoke power. They spoke about authority and security. It's where the elders would sit and decisions would be made. And Hades was that Sheol in the Old Testament, the grave and the afterlife, this unseen but very real realm of the dead. Does this include the forces of Satan and evil here, I know the old King James would say, the gates of hell, and it sticks in all of our minds, doesn't it? That's okay. I don't think Satan is ever too far from the scene in such a subject, right? I mean, right, verse 23, get behind me, Satan, 
And what does scripture tell us? Who holds the power of death? The devil. Hebrews chapter 2. But the main point here is death. The grim reaper. 11 of the 12 disciples would die how? Not quietly in their sleep. But a violent martyrdom. Persecution, hostility, would not have the final say, could not defeat the church. She cannot die. Our builder, our head, is a risen Lord who walked out of his own tomb, and you think the grave is going to whip us? (laughs) By death, Jesus escaped death, and so shall we. Remember the red dragon in Revelation 12. We looked at anti-Semitism a few weeks ago. How do the tribulation saints defeat the devil? Because they love Christ more than their own lives. They're willing to die to live a cross for a crown, gaining by losing victory through martyrdom. Our Lord is the Christ, right? Verse 16, the son of the living God. So he builds a living church and she is immortal. And by his cross, Jesus has now stormed the gates of Death and hell. He's paid our ransom. You want to talk about the ultimate hostage release. Us, sins captives, liberated by the victor, Jesus. How can his church not be victorious? And uh, notice, by the way, Gates is defensive. It can't be offensive. You never read about someone that says, Ooh, here comes the army. They're carrying the gates. (laughs) Hell isn't advancing. The church is advancing. The gospel is spreading. God's word is unstoppable. Christ is building his church against all odds in the teeth of all opposition in the face of every foe. Do you know the last word in the last chapter in the book of Acts, which is the story of the church? In the original, look it up. It's the word unhindered. Unstoppable. It's the last word in the whole book of Acts. God's word, God's gospel, God's kingdom, and Christ's church is unstoppable and invincible. 2 Corinthians 2, when Paul's at a low point, discouraged about the problems in the Corinthian church and waiting for his co-worker Titus to arrive with uh, the latest information, all of a sudden he lifts his eyes forward, he breaks out in praise, and Paul says, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession through Christ and everywhere spreads through us the fragrance of the knowledge of him. To those who are perishing, the stench of death. To those who are being saved, the aroma of life. Look again at the text. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower. The word here is prevail, defeat, overcome, or be victorious against. No weapon formed against us will prosper. As scripture says, nothing in this world or in the next can overthrow the church. Wasn't it hilariously ridiculous to see in Canada with the church of James Coates how the government thought they could put a chain link fence around the living body of Christ who immediately relocated and like tripled in size. Ha 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 ha. You fools. I will build my church. It loses Israel and Marti right now in the very region of Caesarea Philippi, in Kiryat Shemana, and other church planting efforts with daily rocket barrages. Christ is building his church, and we have the privilege of partnering with them in the work of the gospel. Oh, where are kings and empires now of old that went and came? But Lord, thy church is praying yet a thousand years the same. Unshaken as the eternal hills, immovable she stands. Invincible across the earth, a house not made with hands. R.B. Kuyper, earlier in the 20th century, one of my favorite books on the church, it's called The Glorious Body of Christ. A whole chapter entitled The Indestructibility of the Church. Kuyper says, time and again, the church has been violently assailed by the world. First 300 years, fierce Roman persecution, thrown to the lions, lit up as candles in Nero's gardens. Then comes Muhammad in the 6th, 7th century, and the northern regions of this continent were basically emptied of the Christian church because of the advances of Islam. Kuiper says, frequently the very existence of the church has been in jeopardy 
but always the Almighty has intervened in time to preserve his church. In scores of ways, the blood of the martyrs became the seed of the church. Kuiper concludes, God will keep adding to his church until all his elect from every nation are brought in. And child of God, can I immediately make this even more personal to you? If his church can't die, you can't lose your salvation. Eternal life is eternal. No one will snatch them from my hand. No one can separate them from my love when they are in my church. My grandfather used to love passing on a famous quote whenever people would be talking about problems in the church today. He'd say, well, you know, Christianity has to be a divine religion, otherwise it would have died out a long time ago at the hands of its friends. Joel James writes, when a man becomes a pastor, he serves the greatest institution in human history. The philosophical schools and debating halls of democratic Athens are today nothing more than elegant ruins. The Roman Senate is no more. The Holy Roman Empire of Charlemagne is a dull chapter in seldom read history books. The British Empire on which the sun was said never to set has seen its sunset. It too is only a relic of history. In fact, all human institutions, governments, and business endeavors eventually fade and crumble to dust. The one institution that remains is the Church of Jesus Christ. We sang it last week. Crowns and thrones may perish, kingdoms rise and wane, but the church of Jesus constant will remain. Gates of hell can never against that church prevail. We have Christ's own promise and it cannot fail. Let me clarify. I've seen this happen too often. A sincere pastor or sometimes a disqualified leader or some denominational head of the association in a time of great turmoil and conflict gets up and reads this verse to prove that their church and that denomination has to survive. And that is a misuse of this text. And that's an abuse of this passage, I'm afraid. Our Lord has not promised the permanence of any one particular church or group of churches. Go read Revelation 2 and 3. Christ explicitly warns the Ephesian church, if they don't repent, I will remove your candlestick. I'll take away your lampstand. Look across the landscape of church history, past and present. Even though churches might retain beautiful buildings and uh, elegant cathedrals, but Christ has departed. Ichabod is written across their doors. His word is gone. His spirit is gone. His presence is gone. His judgment has fallen. And they're just going through the motions, ticking the boxes, and that dead, hollow, empty churchianity. And they become synagogues of Satan, as Jesus also warns in Revelation 2 and 3. But the invisible body of Christ will always have a visible witness. The universal church will always have a local outpost post, and earthly presence. Christ's church is as invincible as his word and his name. There is a great apostasy coming. Brace yourself. Scripture warns. Wait till we get to Matthew chapter 24. A terrible falling away. The future for the church will get harder, not easier. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth, Jesus says in Luke 18. But please hear this. Few believers does not equal no believers. None of his elect will be lost. God will preserve a remnant. Jesus will build his church. Count on it. You bank on it. We have his word from the head and the owner, the founder and the builder. Our builder, our bedrock, our battle. Dever sums it up well. Christians may wonder at God's patience with the church. We may fear for our own poor stewardship of the church, but we cannot be anything other than confident about the church. It will succeed. The church is God's plan and purpose. And the last two chapters of the Bible show how the church militant now will become the church triumphant on that day. And finally and fully, our prayers will be answered. Hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth. <laughs> Build your church as it is perfectly in heaven. Back to Stone's famous hymn. Mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war, she waits the consummation of peace forevermore. Till with the vision glorious, her longing eyes are blessed. And the great church victorious will be the church at rest. You know, one of the most cherished symbols, 
and biblical images that our Protestant forefathers and Reformation heroes clung to in times of persecution and martyrdom and, and fierce opposition. It was based on the commentary of Calvin in the book of Exodus, the burning bush of Moses. Burning and yet not consumed. Calvin says, that's a good illustration of the church. Whatever fiery trials she faces, she will prevail. And soon after this, uh, after Calvin, it became a, uh, an emblem and a, a slogan and a motto. First of all, for the French Huguenot church, many who came here and had a role in building this South African nation. Some of you are descendants of the Huguenots. And then the Scottish Covenanters, and then Reformed and Protestant churches around the world. And what they would do is they started printing three Latin words under this picture of the burning bush. Nec tamen consumabatur. Not yet consumed. I will build my church. Our choir did a piece a couple of years ago, borrowed from the West Coast Baptist College Choir, and a video that I know ministered to many of us during the COVID lockdowns and the relational and the pastoral strain that many were facing. I know my own family, this song and this anthem became a, a battle cry, and it still moves me every time, and we're actually going to put it on the Antioch alert uh, later today. Gather your family and watch it. I'll give you a taste. And by the way, the setting is almost as good as Caesarea Philippi. It's on the courtyard steps of the beautiful, majestic, authoritative, imperial type of state capital building of one of the most godless, heathen, idolatrous, pagan states of California. And you wonder if up in the office, if the, uh, uh, the godless governor, I'm tempted to say uh, emperor, uh, uh, Gavin Newsom, I believe he's a presidential candidate now. You wonder if he was watching as they filmed this song and this Christian choir declared how Jesus would build his church. I'll just read one stanza, one verse. Every power on earth and heaven is a shadow in his light. No authority, law, or government challenges the sovereign might. His reign and rule have no boundary. All that is, his hands have wrought. Nothing ever can, nothing ever will overcome the Lord our God. Let's pray. 